My name is Joseph Fan. Uh, the only reason I'm here is to spend a few minutes to introduce my uh, icon. And uh, I, uh, you know, I have been looking forward to do this for 30 years, and finally I got this chance. Um, I'm going to introduce Professor Ken Lang. He's a uh, emeritus professor of Cass Graduate School of Business, University of Pittsburgh. Uh, and is also the founding editor of Journal of Corporate Finance. And number three, Ken was my PhD dissertation advisor. Uh, so that qualified me to briefly introduce Ken. Um, everybody know Dan Sepp and Ren 1985 papers. Uh, that is the first, even though it's published in Journal of Political Economy, but it is a very well-cited paper in the finance literature. The big, but I would like to point out, unfortunately, most uh, finance papers citing Jensen and Lane uh, just cite the conclusion. There's no relationship. There's no relation between ownership structure in terms of concentration and firm value. But what I would like to uh, share with you is that Ken always encourage us to put ownership structure or related variable at the left-hand side of the equation. And that is actually Benson and Lenz paper about. Uh, it, uh, people, most people read about the conclusion, but if you read the paper in detail, and if you have further interest, if you read uh, Harold Dempsey's 1983 Journal of Law and Economics paper, it is actually a pioneer analysis about uh, the reason why some firms choose concentrated ownership and why some other firms choose diffuse ownership. Of course, there are trade-offs. Uh, I don't want to go into the, into detail, uh, but I would like to point out that was that was that was that that's the key. I mean, there are reasons why firms organize their ownership in a in in a particular way, and the research methodology is also quite new to financial uh, fi finance researcher. Uh, it uh, deviate from profit maximization, but more generally talk about a utility maximizing firm. Uh, in, a, a firm manager could maximize utility by, by not only maximizing profit, but also maximizing, say, on the job consumptions, values, and so on and so forth. Uh, that really uh, is an eye-opening analysis, but unfortunately, uh, currently, uh, the, the so-called mainstream seems to uh, debating uh, between stakeholder theory and uh, profit maximizing shareholder value, but back in 1985 and 1983, from the very uh, basic and fundamental uh, model, uh, the model is open to all this uh, uh, possibility. But unfortunately, uh, uh, finance researchers have lost track uh, of this uh, methodology. So uh, I think that's the, that's, if people notice this point, today the citation records of Denset and Lane will be more than, way more than 10,000. By the way, 10,000 citation for one single paper, I, I can count the numbers of them. Uh, but Denset and Lane is one of those few papers that attracts so many citations, um, and it is still alive. Um, so, I, um, <laughs> you are still, yeah, right. You need to live longer. Uh, so, without further ado, I would like to uh, give the stage to Professor Ken Lane. Uh, it's my great honor to introduce you. And 
you should be proud of me. I finally put ownership structure at the left hand side and published my paper in the in the special issue of Journal of Law Economics in honor of Harold Insect. Okay. Thank you, Joseph. Um, I have to first apologize. You may think the way I'm walking that I had too many glasses of wine tonight, but I recently had back surgery and I have a balance issue. So if you see me staggering, don't think I overindulged, okay? Um, but I do wanna thank Cam Ming, first of all, for putting this conference together and inviting me to participate. Um, he's done an extraordinary job. The program looks great. I sat in a few sessions this afternoon. Do I need this? Can, does it help? Or? Yeah, you okay. Um, but I was on a committee uh, with an organizing committee with Cam Ming for a conference in honor of Harold Demsetz and Bellin um, and John <laughs> uh, several years ago, which was a casualty of COVID. It never came off, but I got to see firsthand uh, the work that Cam Ming does. And he's just absolutely, he's, he's gonna be Dean material pretty soon here, I think. <laughs> that, uh, and then Joseph, you know, I told him to keep it short and sweet, but when he was a PhD student, he never listened, and now he's not listening. And, but um, but he, he was a great, um, a great asset to University of Pittsburgh and uh, just a real role model for PhD students in terms of identifying a good topic and hand collecting data and doing all the heavy lifting that sometimes is necessary to really study an issue thoroughly. So, so anyway, thank you. And uh, feel free, I'll try to keep this with 30 minutes or so, um, but feel free to interject. I'm generally not one who likes to just stand up here and give a monologue, uh, but especially after dinner and a long day and two prior <laughs> keynote addresses, the last thing you probably want is a monologue. So, so please feel free to um, chirp up anytime you'd like. So I titled the uh, talk ESG and Value Maximization. And a couple of weeks ago, the title was ESG, DEI, and Value Maximization. And I had slides, every slide you're gonna see on ESG, I had for DEI as well. And it just became too cumbersome. <laughs> but anything I say tonight about ESG is gonna hold for DEI as well. But I just decided to get it out completely to make it a little more streamlined. So, um, but, but nonetheless, um, you know, the topic will be ESG and value maximization. And, you know, obviously that has, is kind of a heavily studied topic these days. Um, a lot of the literature is normative as to, you know, what impact does it have on stock prices and does it create value or not and so on and so forth. I'm not gonna touch any of that tonight. I, I, you know, that's not what I'm gonna be focused on, uh, but rather what I'm gonna be focused on is um, just trying to understand um, the evolution of ESG. So why has it become such an important topic? And, and also what explains the cross-sectional variation in ESG activities across firms? And the, um, the, the organizing principle um, is, which I think is generally fair to say in financial economics, is um, the assumption that generally firms get it right. So that value maximization is a way of organizing our thoughts about ESG. And as I mentioned um, on, if I do this right, um, you know, and when you think about, you know, most of the topics that we study in corporate finance and probably capital structure, financing policies of firms is the most heavily studied subject, um, you know, for 50 plus years, um, you know, fairly prototypical experimental design is to put capital structure on the left-hand side and think about the attributes of firms that give rise to more or less debt, all within the framework that, you know, firms are maximizing value. And, you know, the same for payout policy, organizational form. The governance literature gets a little more normative for my taste than but sometimes, but for the most part, we, we start our analyses from the proposition that as a general matter, firms maximize value. Uh, 
And so that's the approach I just wanted to take tonight in my brief comments. And, um, you know, one of the advantages of being a uh, emeritus professor, I'm finding out, is you can, you know, you have, it's, it's kind of liberating. I was telling Dave, you know, you, you don't have to go and do all this empirical stuff. You're not going to hear anything about instrumental variables tonight or identification and all this stuff that uh, is important, but it's not going to be important for my talk tonight. <laughs> you're going to see some data and you're going to probably say, oh, geez. But, but anyway, um, let me um, talk about value maximization very briefly. Um, and the way I like to think about it, for better or worse, is that there are kind of two different views of value maximization as I think of it. Um, one is what I'm calling here ex ante value maximization, um, which basically depicts firms as these super rational maximizers who um, you know, maximize value at you know, every point in time. And it presupposes, in effect, that managers can do you know, calculus to determine what the optimal value maximizing policy is. And there are probably some areas where that's more likely the case than others. Uh, you know, we have a long, rich literature um, on capital structure. And, you know, I know probably most of you have former students who work um, in companies and they actually apply all this stuff in the literature on capital structure to help firms design optimal capital structures. So I'm not denying that there's some of that, but I think the more appropriate way of thinking about value maximization for ESG is to think about what I call uh, ex post value maximization. And, um, you know, the paper that, um, that I cited here was uh, Armin Alci, and I'm sure John has probably read that many times and others, Joseph certainly has. But I think it's one of the most underrated papers in uh, financial economics. It was written in 1950 by Alchian. It was the first systematic economic study on um, evolution and the role that evolution and uncertainty play in economic systems. And you know, the genius of what Alchian did was he said, you know, we don't need to assume that you have these super rational maximizers out there, even if, you know, he didn't use managers per se, but just even if economic actors were all acting randomly, the environment will adopt the practices that maximize value. So it's you know, kind of a traditional Darwinian natural selection process that uh, requires, I think Alchin referred to it as much more modest assumptions. You don't have to you know, say that everybody was super maximizers and they knew rationally what, what to do. And I think that's really useful for ESG. Um, you know, there are a few quotes here uh, by Armin. I'm sorry if I'm blocking, but I do need to hold on to something a little bit. So the second bullet, um, success accompanies relative superiority, and it does not require proper motivation, but may rather be the result of fortuitous circumstances. Um, so obviously that's one of the first insights that he presents. And then the third one, survivors may appear to be those having adapted themselves to the environment, whereas the truth may well be the environment has adopted them. So, so you know, the first part where survivors adapt kind of makes it, makes the ex, ex ante case. You know, they were maximizing, they adapted. Whereas the second one is no, they, they were adopted. The environment sorted out what worked and what didn't. And, um, you know, I really think that, and, and then the last one, which I think is important, is that in a changing environment, trial and error becomes survival or death, um, which again, I think is an important point. And, you know, we, we really as a profession, I don't think, um, have really ever studied in detail how this evolutionary process works and how this Darwinian process works. And I forget Joseph and uh, Tom Bates is here. Um, when I, I know at some point my corporate governance seminar um, in the PhD program, but I can't remember whether it was when you guys were there, um, we read a couple of chapters from a book that has nothing to do with finance. It's called The Beak of the Finch. Uh, 
and it's written by a guy named Jonathan Weiner, who got a Pulitzer Prize. Yeah, we, we read it. You read it, right? Yeah. And you know the the reason for putting it on there, and a lot of the finance students are like, "Why are we reading about finches on the Galapagos Islands?" Is that the first couple of chapters talk about how, for the first time since Darwin, scientists were working out the details, empirically working out the details of the natural selection process on the Galapagos Islands. And the whole book was about how they were tracking finches and measuring the beak and they identified every finch in the Galapagos and they would go back every year and they were testing all these hypotheses. But there were great quotes in there from various naturalists over the years who said, you know, we've all adopted Darwin's theory, but there's absolutely zero empirical evidence for it. Uh, you know, and we just adopted it because it just sounds so logical. And um, so, so here, I mean, for example, this trial and error issue, we know, I think, very little about how that actually plays out in, um, in, in economic systems. Uh, let's see. I, yeah, so, so the, the general framework, and there's no great insight here, is that I think it's useful to start by uh, recognizing that this ESG frenzy um, is really a shock to the business environment. I mean, it, it, now, again, we get into endogeneity and all this stuff, but the bottom line is that this is a fairly new phenomenon. And, you know, we see that if you get it wrong, and I put wrong in quotes because it may not be wrong ex ante, but if it's wrong ex post, <laughs> there are severe economic consequences. And we see that with um, Anheuser-Busch and Target and Disney and just a number of other companies. Um, and so the natural selection process is playing out, you know, in front of us. And um, I, I think, and again, the spirit of my approach here is not to assume that firms are making all these maximizing optimal decisions right now about ESG, I think there's an enormous trial and error process going on, and we don't know how it's going to end. <laughs> and I don't think anybody really knows. I don't think corporate managers know. I don't think BlackRock knows. Is Jerry Garvey here? Maybe he'd tell me they do, but, uh, but it, it's playing out before us. And then just to close the loop on this before getting into some data, um, I just came across recently the second quote was literally the last week, the day I was working on the slides for this that I sent to you. But it was Brian Cox, the CEO of Target, and they just released their quarterly earnings last week. And you probably know their stock price has dropped dramatically after some issues about merchandise they were selling in the stores. And, um, and then they, uh, they reported their earnings numbers, and I guess they were a big disappointment, and they reduced guidance. and. So all this stuff, but the CEO finally said, as we navigate an ever-changing operating and social environment, we are applying what we learned. And then this other quote earlier this summer from uh, the CEO of PPG Industries, a little home cooking there, a Pittsburgh company. Um, he, he was quoted as saying, there's no pure algorithm to put all this stuff in a spreadsheet to tell you what to do. And um, the article went on to talk about how PPG and other companies now are uh, trying to develop internal scoring systems to provide them with guidance as to what they should and should not address, uh, if anything, in terms of uh, political and social matters. So, so again, it's all evolving. It's not like capital structure issues where, you know, I'm sure there's still some new stuff to learn there, but for the most part, you know, CEOs and managers and academics have a pretty good idea of what, what to expect for different companies in terms of the mix of financing. I don't think we do with respect to uh, ESG. So um, I wanted to track you know, the growth of ESG over time, and there are people in this room that are far more expert in doing that than me. Uh, but, you know, again, being a retired professor with no RAs, Dave, uh, maybe you can do something about that. I had to collect my own data, and uh, so I ended up uh, identifying, um, well, I'll get to the sample in a minute, but I, I decided to just as a proxy, and again, I was largely interested in tracking over time the relative importance of ESG. Um, so I collected uh, 10Ks for a sample of companies, 
And then I track the frequency with which five words or terms were used in their 10Ks for four different years. And the words were environment, social, governance, ESG, and climate. I just figured climate, right, environment, and climate, of course, gets used a lot. So I, I should have thought, in retrospect, sustainability, but I forgot that one. So. Um, now, and again, I'm not saying that that's a great measure by any means. It's imperfect. Um, there, there are other people that have been looking at the frequency with which words like that have been used in earnings calls. And uh, they've found similar to what I've found here, not surprisingly, that over time there's been you know, a huge increase in the frequency with which these words are used. And the sample that I used, and again, just in the interest of time, um, you know, I, I have 60 firms in the sample. I picked the 30 in the Dow Jones index, um, simply on grounds that I wanted some big companies and they were easy to identify and so forth. And then 30 dual class companies for reasons that I'll talk about in a minute. So 60 firms. The four years that I'm looking at are the 10Ks released in 2000, 2010, 2000, um, uh, 20, and then the most recent, which for most companies is 2023, but there are a handful that haven't released um, a 10K during this year yet. Um, and so the data shows two things. One, again, not surprising, that there's been a sharp increase in the frequency with which these words are used, uh, but also that there's been uh, an increase in the variation across firms um, in, the, in the use of these words. And I'm not going to bore you with, um, with, with all these graphs, but for example, um, this is a graph of the mean and median number of times that the word environment appears in the 10Ks for the full sample of 60 companies. And you can see, obviously, over time, uh, there's a sharp increase. Um, you know, the mean goes from about 15 to 37 over that roughly 20 year period. Median is a little bit lower, but obviously the same trajectory or similar trajectory. And then I'm just going to do a tour de force here because you'll see the graphs, they all look pretty similar. Uh, what did I do here? I'm sorry, Cam, yeah, I mean, did I? H and V Keystone? I have no idea what that means, but. I have no idea. The guy who lent us the. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, did I press something here? I'm sorry. Yeah, see, I. Okay. I told you. I'm, you are so smart. So. Yes, that right there. Oh, oh yes. Oh, Good job. Wow. Okay. Oh, yeah. What are the rest of the buttons? Yeah, we'll figure it. Oh, wow. But this is governance. You can see a similar um, ESG. Now ESG, I think, was only coined the term in 2005 by. I think the United Nations had a group or something that, so it's unfair to put that in 2000, but you can see nobody mentioned the SG in 2000. And then it's really, um, and you have to be a little careful because obviously the scales on these graphs are different. So this looks like a really sharp increase and it is, but it's going from a really low number to a little bit bigger number. And then climate. And you know what I find interesting here, it's just, you know, the word climate, the, the median number of times that the 60 firms use the word climate in their 10Ks in the year 2000 was zero. <laughs> Nobody mentioned it. <laughs> and now in the year 2023, it's like a very important issue uh, for the operations of businesses. And then um, the next group, and again, I'm just going to, these, these are the standard deviations across the 60 companies. And you can see environment <laughs> and their social governance, ESG, and climate. And the takeaway briefly from that is that, you know, there's a lot of variation. So the secular trend has been an increase, but around that increase is, you know, a ton of variation that is begging to be explained, right? <laughs> um, and so um, there are two things I just wanted to briefly say, um, because again, the focus here is let's start from the assumption that firms are attempting to maximize value um, in, in the Alchian kind of framework. 
Um, and there, but there are two things that had come to my mind a few months ago when Ken Ming asked me to speak here um, that, are, that are just thoughts I had at the time that you know, maybe it's uh, the amenity value of control that you know, Demsets and I wrote about in uh, 1985, where you know, the notion there is that there are certain industries that have assets that uh, provide their controlling shareholders with utility to the point that the controlling shareholders don't want to maximize the value of the firm because that might compromise their ability to derive utility from using the assets in a different way. And you know, the, the prototype would be you know, newspaper publishers. So the Salzburgers who own the New York Times, um, you know, they have a controlling position in the New York Times. Um, you know, they clearly have an editorial policy that they want to propagate and they're willing to presumably forego some value because they want to use those assets to influence public opinion. And when you look more generally at newspapers, they generally are owned by controlling shareholders. Um, so I, I thought, you know, well, may, what about the amenity value control? And, and that's a non-starter uh, because in order to gain this amenity value, you have to have control. And right from the get-go, we know that, you know, the Dow Jones 30, I think the only one where you could say there's a large controlling shareholder is Nike, Phil Knight, uh, where they have, they're also a dual class firm. But you just don't, I mean, you see an enormous amount of ESG activity, or at least referenced ESG, by companies that don't have a controlling shareholder. So, it, it, you know, I, I don't think that's a satisfactory explanation at all. But then the other thing is, you know, if, like, why now? Like, presumably these firms have always, you know, the ones that uh, perhaps engage in ESG, where you have a controlling shareholder, why weren't they doing it, you know, 30, 40 years ago? And then the last one is simply, you know, if it was the amenity value control, I don't think we could explain why the policies, for lack of a better term, are more woke, because presumably there'd be a lot of controlling shareholders that are conservative politically. And so why would the distribution of political activities be so skewed to the left if it was based on that? So I, I think amenity value control is not the answer. The next one um, may elicit some disagreement, but I don't see agency costs as being the reason for this um, for a couple of reasons. One is you know, it's just hard when you look at the, the trend over time, you know, it's hard to imagine that there's been this outburst of agency problems that has suddenly given rise to ESG. Uh, again, why wasn't that happening years past? And then second is um, similar to what I just said, that if it was agency problems, then why would that mean almost all of this stuff is skewed to the left? when in fact we know probably a lot of uh, senior managers are fairly conservative when it comes to their politics. But one, you know, and again, it, <laughs> when you're retired, you can just throw out these ideas. And, <laughs> but, um, you know, one, one thing I thought that if I was still uh, active, um, you know, it could be worthwhile to look at, and I, maybe some of you have done this, again, I apologize if you have, but, um, you know, if you looked at the political leanings of CEOs, you know, let's say a Republican or a Democrat, or you looked at the PAC contributions of the companies, you know, Republican or Democrat, you know, is there, after you control for all the obvious stuff, you know, is there any empirical evidence that, you know, companies with Republican CEOs are less likely to engage in ESG than the ones with Democrat CEOs? And my prediction for what it's worth, which is not much, would be no. And I think that would be an indication too that you know, it's inconsistent with agency costs. And if both Republican and Democrat CEOs are running companies that do roughly the same amount of ESG activity, it suggests you know, there's something else going on. Um, so just a thought. Um, okay. So the, the, um, the, the main thing, and again, this is just the way I think about this stuff. And um, I think 
a useful way to view this is to think about you know, the various stakeholders. So in other words, where is the pressure for ESG coming from? And uh, I know a lot of you have done papers on different individual stakeholders, but you know, I'm kind of looking at the totality of all the stakeholders. And it could be coming from the managers, but we've just given a couple of reasons why I don't think that's the case. Um, then, you know, we also obviously have shareholders and in particular, very large shareholders who are big advocates of ESG, such as BlackRock, Vanguard, State Street. Is it coming from customers or employees or local communities? And in the interest of time, I'll just um, show you what we have here. So, and I apologize, this is throwing a lot of data up on the screen here and um, maybe not setting it up as thoroughly as I should, but you'll see that um, in the left-hand column are the words. And then um, I broke the sample into uh, single class companies and dual class. And originally when I collected the dual class, it was to see under the amenity value control issue, whether the dual class firms, you know, use these words a lot more than the single class, because the dual class have the controlling shareholders. Um, and so what you'll see here is that, um, that so in, if you go across the columns in that you have different years and you see that it grows for both the single class and the dual class. So the word environment, um, it went from 16.7 on average, but if you replicate this with medians, it looks very similar. It went from 16.7 to 37.6 to 45.1 to 51.1. So about a threefold increase over that period. Dual class went 11.5, 18, 24, 27.8. So it more than doubled. So both were going up, but two things. One is that the single class was going up more rapidly than the dual class. But then the other is if you look at the significant question mark, in 2000, before all this stuff started, there was no significant difference in the use of the word environment across the two firms. But across the board after that, the dual class firms referred to that word environment significantly less than the single class firms, which not only is contrary to, um, I think, the amenity value of control, but it also suggests that if firms are insulated from the market for corporate control uh, and maybe the influence of the Black Rocks and so forth, that they don't use these words as much. <laughs> and you know, maybe a couple of other, and again, maybe people have begun to look at it, but um, you know, one thing that then might be interesting is, and it's hard to get the data, but um, you know, do, do private companies, for example, tout their ESG um, activities and use these words and so forth? I think it would be very interesting if there was a matched sample of public and private firms and, you know, if one found that private firms don't do this as much as the public firms. Uh, but just, again, just a thought there. And then when you go across the board, um, you see there are a lot of ends for significance, but if you look at the last two ESG and climate, you see in 2020, 2023, um, you know, there are significant differences and pretty much across the board, even when they're not significant, um, the single class use these words a lot more than the dual class firms. And then the, the kind of uh, derivative question is, you know, is the growth in ESG attributable to the BlackRock, Vanguard, State Streets of the world? Uh, they all obviously are strong advocates of ESG. And, you know, one question is, in my mind at least, is why? Why are they such advocates for ESG? And I know Larry Fink and maybe the other CEOs, they say, well, you know, it reduces risk and it improves financial performance. Um, one conjecture I have is that um, if you look at the growth of assets under management, uh, 
Um, you know, BlackRock just does an enormous amount of business with governments throughout the world. I mean, you know, sovereign wealth funds and pension funds and, and also with universities, um, all of whom may have certain political preferences that make it, and again, it's just conjecture, that make it over time more important for BlackRock to satisfy their political preferences. So that would be one possible explanation, but uh, I wouldn't even call it a hypothesis, it's more a conjecture, but um, you know, in the spirit of Harold Dempsetz, rather than take it as a given that they're in favor of ESG, the question is why are they in favor of ESG? And so what I did here, and it was a little surprising to me, probably less so to you guys, is I went and I got the percentage of equity held by BlackRock, Vanguard, and State Street um, in each of the 60 firms, and then I broke it out for the single class and the dual class. And somewhat to my surprise is if you look at the bottom number, it's the sum of the ownership stakes by the three. For the full sample, on average, the three own 20.9% of the common shares uh, of the firms. For the single class, it was 20.7. For the dual class, it was 21. It was actually higher for the dual class than it was for the single class. And yet, I am assuming, I may be wrong, but I'm assuming given the uh, structure of dual class firms that BlackRock has significant less in influence on dual class firms than it has single class. But it makes sense when you think about them being passive investors and indexing that they're going to have a lot of dual class firms. But, uh, but nonetheless, uh, I found that interesting. And then what I did here was I looked at, um, I, I, so I ranked the sample based on the combined ownership of the three firms. And in my simplistic way, I just said, let's look at the firms below the median and above the median. <laughs> Uh, so above the median means that BlackRock, Vanguard, and State Street own a lot more of the equity than for firms below the median. And then the question is, well, are the ones above the median, do they use these words a lot more than the ones below the median? And the answer, you can just go to the last column, you see there's no significant difference in the use of any of the words Re, you know, depending on how much ownership by those three firms. So, and by no means is this probative or definitive, but, you know, it, it, you know, and somebody who had the energy and the data and the RAs to, you know, might be able to <laughs> do a better job, but at least it's suggestive that at least it, it as a first pass, um, you know, maybe BlackRock, Vanguard, and State Street are not really having that much influence on this. Maybe the source of ESG is is coming elsewhere. And then the next one is a variant of this one where I uh, uh, created a two by two matrix. So I continue, I one of the, um, so the columns basically are um, above and below median. Again, the ownership by the three. And then I did it for single class and dual class. So you see the single class with large ownership by BlackRock, uh, et cetera, they use the word environment 62.8 times in 2023. Those are the ones who you would think would be most potentially influenced by BlackRock, et cetera. The ones that would be least would be, I think, the dual class firms with low ownership by BlackRock, uh, Vanguard, and State Street. And you do see that for them, it's 31.08. And the significance level is when you go down that diagonal, yes. So there was a significant difference there. Um, so, it, so it's a little, again, I think a more thorough analysis of the data would potentially be worthwhile. But, um, but, but that's what I did with respect to the BlackRock, et cetera. For the, for the other variables, there is no like if you look at social governance, ESG, and climate, um, there is no significant difference across those two extreme selves, um, which again would be consistent with not having much influence. Um, then the second, uh, or next one, not second, um, is whether um, customers are driving 
the ESG phenomenon. And, you know, on a surface level, it seems like maybe they are because, you know, the, the firms that have been in the news about a lot of this stuff, you know, the anheuser Bushes and the Targets and the Coca-Colas and the Nikes are all retail firms. And you don't, you don't see many Wall Street Journal headlines about, you know, wholesalers who are doing a lot of ESG stuff. Uh, but I think it is a lot more nuanced than that. Um, you know, but, but nonetheless, I wanted to cut it retail and non-retail. Uh, but the complicating factor with retail, I think, even before you look at the data, is that not all retail customers are the same. I mean, there's a lot of heterogeneity in terms of their preferences for these policies. And we see that with Anheuser-Busch, right? Uh, you know, they really ticked off a lot of their clientele. And, you know, Target ticked off both sides of the spectrum on ESG by the way they handled it. Uh, so there's a lot of divergence in the customer base. You know, in the customer base of Smith & Wesson, which makes guns, is probably a lot different than the customer base of Patagonia. Uh, so it's not like you can treat the customer bases as being homogeneous. And then with respect to non-retail, the more I thought about it, and I, I really think that this potentially could be a much more important catalyst for ESG uh, than I had appreciated prior to getting this invitation, is, um, you know, I, I was thinking, you know, the, the, the ones who are non-retail, they often have very, very large contracts with, um, with the government. And, and what I'm saying here tonight, I should have said earlier, is it sounds provincial because I'm getting U.S. data, but, you know, I, I think all the stuff applies, at least conceptually, to ESG throughout the world. But, um, you know, you look in the United States, and I think, you know, Zingales has written a little bit about the um, politicization of corporations and the corporate, corporatization or something of politics, that the two are dovetailing. But when you look at um, over time, you know, government subsidies of business have gone up substantially. And in the United States, you know, um, under Biden, the uh, corporate subsidies have, I mean, really big. I mean, I don't know if you've looked at the numbers, but I think the Inflation Reduction Act is, you know, has something like a $1.2 trillion of subsidies. Um, you know, Ford Motor got a low-cost government loan from the Energy Department for $9.2 billion. $9.2 billion. And, you know, when you look at those numbers, and I'm not an expert in the data on capital raises in the United States, but um, I think, just based on past data, um, if you look at the total amount of capital raised through equity and debt issues and compare it to the numbers that are being bandied about, <laughs> I mean, the government, in some sense, I think, is distorting the capital market decisions in ways that could be the catalyst that really is uh, behind a lot of the growth in ESG. Um, you know, and just look, you know, you look at the chip bill that, um, you know, that recently passed, was signed by uh, President Biden. It, um, in order to be eligible for the chip subsidies, you have to adhere to a number of the ESG policies that the, gov the federal government of the United States wants. And companies are doing it hand over fist. I mean, it's oversubscribed. I think that was only, quote unquote, $280 uh, billion. And it's been oversubscribed. <laughs> but anybody who gets that money has got to play by the rules of the game here. So I think it really is nuanced as to whether there would be and it would require, obviously, looking at the retail customer base and then controlling for all the uh, government contracts that a non-retail firm had to see if there's any association with ESG. Um, but the bottom line is, when you look at the data, and this is like almost pathetic, um, I, I did actually hire, because I didn't get an RA, but I hired one. <laughs> um, and I, I just told them to find, you know, some recent uh, JFE or JF papers that looked at retail versus non-retail. And I think the retail were the SIC codes between 5,000 and 59.99. So I said, let's just, that has the blessing in the academic literature, let's do it. But then you only end up with nine retail firms. 
And some of the non-retail firms were companies like Procter & Gamble, which had an SIC code that put them in the manufacturing group well, but they sell so many consumer products like Gillette and you know all these different detergents and soaps and even Apple, right? Apple Computer uh, is not listed as retail, yet it has a huge retail brand name. So it's kind of a crummy measure, to be honest. And even if it was a good measure, I think the nuances would require more in-depth work than this, but nonetheless, I wanted to share it with you. And then the last one is whether geography influences ESG policy. And um, I think there are at least a couple reasons to think that it might. Um, one would be that you know part of the catalyst for ESG might be the employees. Um, I remember there was a, a, a a tech firm in downtown Pittsburgh, and I met with the uh, some of the senior managers this is about five years ago, and he was telling me that um, the political position, this is anecdotal, but nonetheless, the political positions and the culture in the workplace were more important to new MBA students than the money relative to what it had always been in the past. And he said, in the past, you know, whoever offered you the most money is the one who got you. And he said, we're having people turn down, you know, jobs at 110, 120,000 a year to work for us, you know, for 80,000 a year. And he said, the reason is that, you know, we're a politically active company, we're ESG, we have a culture here in the firm that they like, and they're willing to forego income. McKinsey did a study, I think, in the last year um, asking companies, I think it was mostly survey data, but nonetheless, um, employer retention was one of the major reasons that, um, that companies gave for uh, their ESG policies. And the presumption here, and this again is another <laughs> imperfect measure, but if you look at where companies are headquartered uh, or more generally where their activities are, if their operations and headquarters are in areas that are more politically conservative or politically liberal, um, that presumably would be reflected in the workforce, which in turn could be related to their ESG policies. So um, that was kind of my thinking there. And then the preferences of local communities, obviously, um, same thing. If, you're in a rel if your operations are in a relatively politically liberal area versus conservative, that may cause you to engage in more or less ESG policy. And to add to the list of imperfect measures, what I did was I just identified um, where the headquarters of these companies were located. Um, so I didn't do the painstaking research you did, Joseph, where I mapped everything out, where all the operations were. but. So this is just headquarters, and I realized that for a lot of these firms, you'd want to go deeper than that. But I looked at where they were headquartered, and then um, I looked at the percentage vote for the Republican congressional candidate in the district in which the company was headquartered in the most recent uh, 2022 election. And the presumption here is that the higher the Republican vote, the more conservative, the higher the Democrat vote, the more liberal, and then wanted to see whether or not that was at all associated with differences in ESG. And you see the answer generally is no. Uh, the one exception is the word climate. So the ones that were more Republican, if you will, uh, they cited climate 6.3 times. The ones that were more politically liberal, 13.10. And that was significant at the 5% um, level. And I should have said that, that the yeses are only if they're significant at the 5% level. And I know when I used to um, publish more, uh, we often would report significance levels at the 10%, 5%, 1%. <laughs> uh, but since doing some expert witness stuff more regularly, the courts require 5%. If you say something is significant at the 10% level, it's like, no. So I've been a, um, basically indoctrinated by that. So I made 5% my cutoff here as well. Um, so uh, just concluding comments. Again, I think it's useful 
to um, think of ESG as a shock and a shock that has changed the environment in ways um, that are causing firms to engage in experimentation, adaptation, trial and error. Um, you know, for lack of a better term, I hate this word, but you know, I think assuming that they're at some kind of equilibrium is obviously misplaced because, I mean, certainly when you look at stock price reactions to some of these companies' policies and then them backtracking and changing, they're all kind of groping for it. And, you know, our, I think the culture of um, being in economics generally and financial economics is we, we even though we know better, it, it's this notion that everybody's always maximizing, but sometimes... You, you don't know what to do. And uh, going back to Alchian, you know, the environment will ultimately determine what is value maximizing. Um, and I think that that process is still, um, in, you know, going to play out here. So anyway, I'm sorry, I probably went over and, yeah. <clears throat> no, okay, thank you very much. So, <laughs> kind of who that is, yeah.